Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today we are here to talk about the first five days of the Tour de France and there is a lot to talk about. Not in the least because Wout van Aert has been putting in some fabulous and absolutely astonishing performances and Isam is here to discuss them with me. Isam, thank you for being here. Yes, thank you for having me and uh, hello everybody. So we are recording just after the fifth stage of the Tour de France finished from Lille to Arenberg just in front of the infamous Touré de Arenberg. And man, what a stage did we just see, but not only what a stage here. I mean, if we look back at Friday, we've been treated with amazing stages almost every day, or well, at least the final part of the stages were interesting because the start in Denmark, it was absolutely fantastic to see so many people coming out in the rain in Copenhagen to look at the Grand Depart with a prologue for the first time since 2017 and I mean the Belgians were secretly hoping that Van Aert could beat Ghana he did eventually just lost out to another Belgian Yves Lampard who surprisingly got lucky in a bit of a weather lottery and took home the win and the first yellow jersey just a handful of seconds ahead of Wout van Aert what did you think about that prologue of Wout van Aert what did you expect going into the prologue and then with the weather and just how it went is on we knew that the weather was probably going to play a role. The teams, when they actually could select the starting times, they were informed that the rain would be falling a little bit later in the stage of uh, of the prologue range of time. And yeah, we knew that the weather was going to play a role. Van Aert was obviously going to be good. We knew that he was going to be good. But then, yeah, we have to obviously... One of his biggest rivals, in a way, is obviously the world champion, Filippo Ganna. Um was Van der Poel going to have a good time trial? You know, those were kind of the guys that we were looking forward to. And when Van Aert crossed the line, I'm not going to lie, I was uh, quite certain that that was going to be it. That there was not going to be someone else behind him that's going to beat that time. And then you saw the weather slowly but surely improving. The road became a little bit easier because it was quite wet when Van Aert uh, did his time. And then you see uh, Lampard five seconds quicker in the end. And then it's like, uh, okay... <laughs> Uh, a bit of a shame and then the Wout van Aert in second place becomes uh, becomes the meme um, and and the story of uh, of the tour yeah until uh, his first win yeah because i think that in a dry prologue he doesn't win because then Ghana wins on the straights Ghana was 1 second per kilometer faster than van Aert there's some data freaks who searched all of this on Strava and other sources where they could find data and Ghana was much faster on the straight and be aware Van Aert and Ghana were riding at the same time so they had similar conditions but Ghana simply didn't have the confidence in the corners and I think there is the part where the technique of Van Aert which we also see in cross comes into play Van Aert of course in cross is kind of known as not the rider with the best technique but that's mainly because he's up against Macho van der Poel as an insane technique I think still, if you look at it, Van Aert has a top technique in the cyclocross world as well. Maybe only Pitcock and Van der Poel are above him. So definitely no surprise to see him do well on the cornering aspect of the prologue, especially in the section around the Little Mermaid, which was the most technical part. He was able to take the seconds back on Ghana, and then just unlucky that Lampard is uh, a bit well quicker in the end or luckier with the weather, but... Nevertheless, a decent result from him. And of course, well, he wasn't that happy because he's been second in time trials quite a lot of times, also an important one. But he was still okay with it because I think he always knew it was going to be hard to win. But then in the days after, there was this storyline forming, as you said, kind of the meme. People were laughing, oh, Van Aert second again, Van Aert second again. Because in the mass sprints of stage two and three, he both end second, second beaten by Groenewegen and Jakobsen, or well, actually the other way around. But yeah, I think that's kind of where the frustration started to kick in, in a way. That, okay, he has the yellow jersey, but he really wanted to win a stage. And just in three occasions, he just barely misses it. And we could kind of see already in the Belgian press, hmm, does Van Aert need to become a bit more of a dick in a way? Does he need to shout some swear words after he finishes second instead of going to the press saying oh yeah i'm very upset but well tomorrow is a new day we saw that especially on the transfer day what did you think about those sprints and then the news that was forming around it for me personally going into the tour i expected van Aert to be up there in the sprints but 
not to win. Like if he was going to be lucky in one of the sprints, positioning himself very well, which he was basically doing the second and third stage, you know, then he had a chance. But we have seen already from some results in the past that Jakobsen for sure has, you know, uh, just that little bit more top speed than Van Aert has. Van Aert is a very good sprinter, but just misses out a little bit on, on, on the speed of Jakobsen. And we could see that the same uh, with uh, stage three with Groenewegen. So I think Van Aert's way of, of, of riding and positioning is, is very good. He's um, quite lucky to have a domestique in, in, the, in the name of uh, Christophe Laporte, who basically can sprint himself very well as well and is a great uh, road captain making sure that uh, Van Aert is going to be starting a sprint at the front and I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand the criticism and the way the Belgians were going on, on Van Aert I think he just did three extraordinary stages before the fourth stage and you know everything was going to plan he had points for the green jersey uh, he was a bit unlucky in stage one and overall it was just a I guess a very good start for him. I think it's typical Belgian, you know, because the Belgian media, they live in a country and operate in a country where cycling is the main thing. Like, it's the biggest sport there, especially in Flanders. People, well, of course, football is also big, but people at their dinner table, they talk about it. The news opens with it. It's the big deal. And they always want the highest and they become maybe too optimistic because I agree with you. I don't think Vaart is the fastest sprinter. I think that Jakobsen, Groenewegen, Philipsen, maybe even Caleb Ewan, who hasn't had an opportunity to sprint yet, are faster than he is. Laporte positions him well, and that leads to Van Aert getting very good results. But I never expected him to win a full flat mass sprint, because last year we saw in the Tour in the real flat sprints, Cavendish was better. This year, the riders of the level of Cavendish. He won on the Champs-Élysées due to perfect positioning on the road he made sure that Cavendish couldn't pass and don't forget the Champs-Élysées is slightly uphill as well so I didn't expect Van Aert to win a mass sprint so I thought that the entire talk about oh uh, can he finally win oh it must be so embarrassing to end third or second three times in a row was a bit silly in my opinion and definitely not needed however I think it's also fair to say that Van Aert should be happy that he does end second in that second stage because Sagan was doing some weird tricks with his shoulder and that could definitely end di in a different way if Van Aert doesn't have the capabilities he has to keep his balance. Yeah, sprints are always tricky and I, I don't know um, because with the Sagan had, had several incidents in stage two as well with, um, I think it was Pedersen or Steven, I'm not really sure, but it was one of the track guys. Or no, it was Jakobsen as well. He had an issue with um, going in later uh, just before the sprint, but it's just very tricky, the sprints, especially in the Tour de France, especially stage two, because that was the first sprint. It's always hectic. It, it's crazy, the sprints in the Tour de France, compared to, to other sprints in a way. And, you know, Van Aert is just someone that really can manage himself quite well through those um, to those sprints. And thank God that he is not involved in any crashes or anything. And that's partly because of his skills and partly because of luck. Because if you see the... The situations they end up in, it's sometimes crazy how they actually end up without crashing. And um, yeah, it's just a spectacular way of uh, handling your bike for sure. I definitely think what Sagan was doing there was over the line. He was barging with his shoulder into Kristoff, then into Ewan. After that, he almost puts Philipsen into the barriers. Then after that, he sta starts banging with Jakobsen. So, no, he, I don't think he really was involved with Van Aert too much. Van Aert was kind of out of it. But, of course, if Sagan causes a crash around Van Aert, you never know what happens. But after that, Sagan needs to squeeze through a gap with Jakobsen and the Stuyven, who was the lead out of Pedersen. For that, of course, it looks like Sagan does something extreme. But I think it's important to note that on that second occasion, there's really nothing that Sagan can do. Stuyven is dropping back. There's no place to cross on the right side. If he breaks, then he causes a massive pileup behind because Caleb Ewan, who is in his wheel, will just smash into him as nobody expects you to break when you're going 60 kilometers an hour. So he really has to kind of squeeze through between Jakobsen and then eventually Jakobsen still finds a way through and wins that stage. But 
nevertheless, it just shows how tricky it is and how much needs to go right before you are in a position that you can win. So, yeah, definitely a bit of overreaction there on the side of the Belgian media, but it's kind of expected because it's kind of the way that their media landscape is. They are super demanding of their riders and second isn't always enough. Small skip to stage 3, where he also ends second, it's kind of a similar scenario. Van Aert perfectly dropped up by Laporte, then moves over to the right side of the road, which is a deviation by the letter of the law, it should be a declassation, so that doesn't mean out of the road race, but put on the last place of the group, but by the standard of what happens in sprinting, it wasn't that bad, so nothing really to come from that. But then after this rest day, with that, which had more criticism on Wout van Aert, we came to the fourth stage and Van Aert really just used his leg to keep the critics quiet, didn't he? When I saw the the way they climbed up uh, a fourth category, I climbed 800 meters, but just the one after the other it was Van Oudonk with Benoit just pulling crazy. And then after that, Van Aert was still able to have a kick. Vingegaard and Yates, you know, two riders that we know are capable of uh, doing crazy things on a, on a climb, but just not able to follow. It was a shorter climb, obviously, but just the, 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 the punch that he had. And then after a climb, that eight kilometers that he had to do after the descent and just, yeah, he didn't lose any terrain, any ground to the, the guys behind him that were pulling with three, four guys. It was super impressive. I... In all in all honesty, I didn't see such a, I haven't I haven't seen such a performance in a in a while, really in a while. It was truly, truly yeah, great performance. I mean, you say you haven't seen such a performance in a while. I mean, of course we saw something similar in Paris Nice with a similar climb with Yumbo blowing up the race, but that's not at the highest level. I'm relatively young. I turned nineteen this year. I've been watching cycling since twenty eleven. I've been of course Looking a bit into the past, and I know uh, quite a, th- a lot of things about racing in the zeros, but I don't really remember any performance like this. Like For me, this is maybe one of the most impressive things I've seen as a cycling fan, as a cycling follower, like forever. Because, of course, I've seen crazy things like the Pogacar attack last year, or don't forget the Froome mountain raid in the Giro, but... I don't think I've seen something impressive on such a small hill and then such a time trial after that it was just next level like now even I'm still a bit lost for words because this is why I love cycling like unnecessary of my bias I do like Van Aert a bit mainly on the road because he's a cyclocross guy but this is just why I love cycling it's just perfect for me to see the yellow jersey leader of the race most iconic jersey in cycling he's just attacking he goes for it sends it because he wants that stage no he doesn't settle for um just the yellow jersey he does he isn't satisfied with another sprint where he potentially ends second or third again no he says i'm going to risk it i'm going to give it my everything put everything on the line see what happens his team supports him and then you just have this fabulous picture of the yellow jersey just pacing past the coast, going towards Calais, where he can claim his stage victory, becoming the first Belgian since Freddy Martens in, I think, 1976 to win the win a tour stage in the yellow jersey. It was just super impressive, and I really enjoyed it. It was definitely a moment that will stand out to me in the coming years. Yeah, There's something you will talk about for, for years to come, and in every highlight that you're going to have, from this Tour de France, this 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 can't be missed, and yeah, it, it is just it was it was really unbelievable to see, especially like you said. I mean, the hill stuff. I think we have seen something like that before. That you can blow up a whole peloton, and you have only one guy that ends up on the top alone. And but then the eight kilometers after that, the time trial, the way he was just blazing through the the kilometers were just passing by, and he was just going and going and. He, you truly saw him a little bit in difficulty in the last kilometer, but you know the gap was already there, and then you can lose a little bit to to make sure that you, yeah, just don't blow up in a way. And yeah, it was truly unbelievable to see. And like like I said, it's I was really silenced when I saw that, <laughs> silent of excitement and of, uh, yeah, just surprised in a way and excited in another way. It was truly truly amazing. 
Well, as much as I've praised the Valve just now, I do want to say a couple of things about the win, and it doesn't do anything off against the win of Out Van Aert, but I did notice that once he was solo, he got a massive draft effect, because at some point we got this heli shot and we saw one car, 12 motos, a neutral car in front of him, it was insane, and that's something that's always there in the tour, it will always benefit the attackers, it's not necessarily bad, but in a way it also is, like... It, the draft benefit it gives you, it's been tested in wind tunnels, there's models for it, and the benefit it gives you is just huge, and it is unfair because the peloton doesn't have it, and some will say, yeah, okay, but it benefits the brake, so it pulls it equal because the brake is always in the disadvantage. I mean, I don't know how to think about that, but it was just something that I noticed, and the final thing I noticed on that win was that on the top of the climb, Van Aert, he could have waited for Vingegaard, pulled Vingegaard and Yates towards the finish and took an, taken a handful of seconds over the other rivals, think they would still have finished with a similar gap. He didn't do that, and fair enough, because he's in the heat of the moment, he's at his max, looks behind, sees Yates, he doesn't know who's where, so if you wait, you don't know what happens, because for all you know, a rider like Van der Poel or Sagan or even Pogacar are just five, se five meters behind and they eventually sit in your wheel and you lose everything. So I fully understand his decision. In hindsight, it would have been better to wait for Vingegaard, but that's what it already says. It's in hindsight. I don't know how you think about that, Isam, but personally, I think in the moment, it makes 100% sense to just pace. Yeah, and I, I think that was in initially the plan. I think they were riding for him and not for the leaders to, to, to have a gap. And I think if, if Vingegaard was alone... Uh, without Yates in his wheel, he would have probably waited. But the fact that Yates was also there made it just a little bit more tricky, and I think that made for him the decision a little bit easier to just go and not wait for Vingegaard. And, you know, eventually that was 100% the right decision because when you're with three, uh, somebody who doesn't want to pull, you have Yates in your wheel, it's going to be a little bit difficult to just have that gap and maintain that gap. And I think that's... You know, alone it's a bit easier. He's in the yellow jersey. Like you said, the cars, everybody is there in front, the police. I think it was headwind as well after the climb. If that was really the case, you know, it's obviously a little bit easier. But, you know, he put himself in that position and he, you know, he deserves every praise of, of what he did in that stage. It was a tailwind in the end. The wind forecast did suggest a headwind, but it changed towards a tailwind just a couple of hours before the race started. But still with a tailwind... You always create your own headwind whilst riding and that effect was massively well reduced due to these cars and motors in front but Van Aert can't do anything about it it's still a super impressive race because he keeps off a storming peloton and I mean he only loses time in the last kilometer when he doesn't take risks in the corner sits up to celebrate and few things top a uh, photo fin picture of a rider finishing solo with a storming peloton in the background and I mean, this was just one of those beauties. A yellow jersey winning in front of the peloton. Just perfection. That yellow jersey, he got to start in that again today on the cobble stage. And we were kind of hoping for, or, well, were we ho what were we actually hoping for this morning? Is some, I was hoping for an entertaining stage in which there would be no bad luck for any of the GC riders. But still a lot of action with some gaps and... Uh, an exciting race for the win with hopefully Van Aert and Van der Poel in it although Van Aert was probably going to need to work for his GC leaders what did you hope for this morning? To be honest I just hoped for some action there is always going to be some action if if a GC leader is uh, is you know has an unfortunate situation with a puncture or anything I didn't wish anyone to crash or but I, ju I just wanted to see a battle between the, the GC leaders, uh, leaders and also a battle between the, the competitors of, of the couples, the specialists in a way. And I think in a way we got that, in another way we didn't. But it was nevertheless a super, super, super exciting race uh, that, we, that we had to see. Well, a super exciting race is almost an understatement for what we got. Because it was just two hours or one hour and 30 minutes only of action, action, action. And for me it was a roller coaster, roller coaster of emotions as well because... Let's wind it back. We go on to the first cobble sections and these cobble sections weren't actually hard or the decisive factor today. The decisive factor today was luck. Riders 
having punctures, riders having crashes. We saw in the beginning that Ben O'Connor, one of the GC candidates, had a puncture, was thrown back. Jack Haig, he crashed, was forced to withdraw from the race later on. On The further we got onto the cobbles, the more bad luck that started happening. Because in the end, we had a group of, I think, 13 riders up the road and were basically GC riders that didn't have any bad luck and a handful of their helpers. Because Vingegaard had a puncture, took out half of the Jumbo team as they had a disaster class. He got onto the bike of Van Hooydonk, which was way too big. Then he needed to get a bike from the team car as he was just hopping onto the bike of, I think, Benoit on the other side of the road. Well, it was... Definitely a big mess going on there, and then later on you have a hay bill coming onto the road, Roglic crashing over it, losing two minutes, Pogacar attacking, looking to almost decide the tour by taking more than a minute. Van Aert, who had already crashed way earlier in the stage and then escaped hitting the back of a car when he was being brought back, he didn't look too good, was staying in the middle of the peloton. And then in the end, somehow he finds his legs again, and when he finally waits for Vingegaard, he paces, 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 keeps on pacing. In the end, what looked to be a lost situation for him, way down on the virtual yellow jersey, he managed to pull the Vingegaard group back to just 13 seconds behind Pogacar, who had attacked together with Jasper Stuyve. Van Aert then also manages to keep his yellow jersey somehow, something that looked near enough impossible until 3 or 4 kilometers to go. So I definitely went from thinking, whoa, this is disappointing. The tour has already decided here. Roglic out with bad luck. Vingegaard out with bad luck. Ben O'Connor out with bad luck. Hmm. To, wait a minute. Almost all the GC riders have finished just 13 seconds down on Pogacar. Van Aert somehow keeps the yellow jersey. A great millimeter sprint for the win. This was pretty awesome in the end. But, yeah, there was so much happening and it's difficult to process. So... What, did, what was your key takeaway from this stage? Uh, in the end, I think uh, what I didn't really understand from the tactics of, of several teams was the way they used their riders. Because there was it was very nervous just before the, um, before the couple sections. And you had like, I think from kilometer 90, 95 till uh, the first uh, couple section at 75 kilometers uh, to the finish. It was it was really hectic and they were really pushing everywhere and I think a lot of teams were actually already using a lot of a lot of their riders just before the couples and what we really saw was that at the end when every couple section was done and we were basically in the positions that we were in in a way uh, many teams just had only one rider or, n- or not even one helper in a way I mean Pogacar I think didn't have a teammate or maybe only one uh, Vlasov had Schachman, if I am not mistaken, and there were some guys. I think uh, Arkea had two two guys as well with Quintana, but it was just eventually when you're done with all the couples, you know, you cannot maintain the gap that you had, and then we saw just uh, Jumbo that had to bring back Vingegaard and Roglic that in the end lost two minutes. You know, uh, that was eventually we you know we had all these guys coming back together and. We saw then Philips winning that sprint of that peloton, and yeah, that was just the the main thing that I saw. That I think some teams could have used the situation a little bit more to their advantage. Uh, and in the end, we have no big losers uh, apart from I guess O'Connor and and the Roglic really. Yeah, that's kind of how the things look like at the moment. Those two, the real losers. I mean, you could of course also say Hague as DNF a big loser. He already lost some time though. But definitely unfortunate for him as well. We also saw Lutsenko ending in the Roglic group. Don't know how much I should think about that because he isn't really a big GC guy. Another rider, Manches, for the back end of the top 10, loses, I think, three minutes or something on the group of uh, Pogacar together with O'Connor. Unfortunate for those guys, but it's kind of part of this. I can get where the people are coming from that say this shouldn't be in a GT because... From a commercial perspective, it's terrible if the Tour would be decided today. It's stage 5, it wouldn't be good for them. They want to keep close racing for as long as possible, at least until you reach the mountains. On the other hand, if you want to win the Tour, you need to be a complete rider. The Tour isn't only about being a good climber. This is kind of part of it, but as the cobbles weren't the decisive factor today, it was much more about luck. When do you crash? When do you puncture? That's kind of... The thing is that 
played a bigger decisive role today and especially Roglic he was at the front he's just very unfortunate that the TV moto hits a bit of hay that's lying on, laying at the back of the roundabout and then comes onto the road Ewan goes over it Roglic has nowhere to go so unlucky there's nothing you can do and there's nothing to say that this can't happen in a normal flat stage but the chances do increase in a cobble stage as there's much more pressure to be at the front so I can definitely see where they are coming from and I would have maybe been talking a bit differently if Pogacar had taken one and a half minutes on Vingegaard and three minutes on Roglic etc but I do kind of think that the tour is about being a complete rider and this is in a way part of it I think they should, for for the the next couple of tours, I think this is something that you can add, but it must not be something that should be every year. I, I think that once every three years or something would be good, but it shouldn't be something that we need and it has to be mandatory in the Tour de France. I mean, uh, I much rather want to see also a team time trial and time trial uh, that uh, a hill time trial in a way so i mean those kind of things are also elements that we can add in and i think it makes the tour a little bit more exciting and gives it more variation if you have one year a little bit more couples or couple stage and then the other year you have a little bit more time trial and so on we can make it also entertaining for us the viewers to make it uh, a little bit more exciting and not the same dull to the fronts that we have every year and i guess you know, the Grand Depart work abroad with Copenhagen, which was truly awesome to, to see and to witness and something great and new that that always works for Tour de France. And then I guess now with a couple stage, I mean, I had, it was like I was watching seven races in a row or something. It was my emotions were, like you said, they were getting um, anywhere. And every time you were like, okay, now it's this situation. And then you moved on already to the next situation. And yeah, that was. Uh, I really enjoyed this stage, and maybe would have spoken a little bit different if indeed Pogacar, you know, had that time gain that he had initially, and even had a bigger gap. But uh, fortunately, that's that's not the case, and we still have a very open to the front, in my opinion. Yeah, I do agree on your point about rotating different types of types of courses. That's probably the best. One year team time trial, another year cobble stage. And when they do a cobble stage, it doesn't always need to be like this. I think the most difficult thing today was not necessarily the difficulty of the sectors, just the way that they needed to get to the sectors that were chosen by the ASO. And the fact that the sectors were chosen in a way that there was almost no time for recovery between the sectors, that's what meant that there was hardly any time to recover. Because if you look to Paris-Roubaix, there you see that on the sections between the cobble sectors, there's often gaps of a couple of kilometers where there's time to recover or sometimes there's like this middle part where there's 10, 12 kilometers of no cobblestones and then everything can regroup again and if you ha have had a puncture you can come back there and then the race can start again for you. But here today there was really no time for that because it was just cobblestone after cobblestone after cobblestone, sector after sector, corner, village, roundabout. It was just so hectic that there was really nothing you could do to recover the losses you had so that was what happened today and i think in the end it's unfortunate for roglic especially as he was looking good he was up there and he's just super unlucky that this hay comes onto the road and causes a crash so that's unfortunate something should be done about that and in the end i do think we both agree that it is a part of cycling and everyone needs to deal with it Let's finish this episode then because a lot of has happened with a short talk about Mathieu van der Poel. Van der Poel not being great. What do you think is up with him? I, I It's hard to say, but I guess, you know, the program that he has run with the Giro, then the month off, and then now back in the Tour de France, no races in between. It was just... Before he started the tour, it was for me, it was like, hopefully he's going to be in the shape that he was last year, but it's going to be very difficult and we have no indication of what it's going to be in terms of shape. And uh, I guess that is what is coming out right now. It's not really his best form. We know that he can perform way better than uh, than he does right now. Uh, he knows himself as well. And yeah, if you don't have the legs, it's just not going to be there. And then you can do a lot of things. You can just hope that the three weeks, you know, that you can get in a rhythm. Maybe the legs will come in week three and then 
but then the you know I don't think the stages are really going to be suiting him in week three Adam so yeah it's just a very tricky situation for him right now I guess there's a handful of stages he can do something in but I do indeed think that the bad leg slash bad form are kind of down due to that Giro slash Tour double. He was already overhyped for the opening prologue with this Fortex partnership suit, which was all of a sudden made look like he was racing with the most aerodynamic kit, which wasn't true. It was a partnership, not the kit itself. It was also not the fastest kit anymore as Be A Racer has launched an even faster kit. So I think the result of him in the prologue is kind of even a good one, considering the fact that he isn't feeling great. But he already said it, I couldn't push the numbers I wanted to. So I think he got lucky with the weather as well. So yeah, what's left for him? I mean, he should try tomorrow. Tomorrow we go to Longwy, which is a perfect finish for him. If that doesn't go well, I think he should draw his conclusions after week one, really. Stages eight and Nah, not 9, but 8 is still something for him. If that doesn't go well, I think maybe it's better to conclude that the Giro Tour double has failed. It's too early. He finished only his first Grand Tour in the Giro. Did a lot of breakaways there. Got tired. So it's not bad to conclude that, hey, wait, this isn't it. It's not as good as last year. It's fine. I'm going to take some time off and then see when I come back. If I need to skip the World Championships, so be it. Because there's no point in trying to race around burned out or without any good base. Then you're only hurting yourself and the rest of your chances. So just draw the conclusion maybe in a couple of days. Hey, is this still going to work or not? Because nobody gets better during a Grand Tour. The only thing that can happen is that you decline less. But if you're already feeling not that great, it's not likely that that's going to change very quickly. So we will just wait and see. Tomorrow, that long wee stage, what do you think for Van der Poel? And then maybe also across to Van Aert or any other stage favorite? Well, hard to say. I If I look at the stage, to be honest, I would more, I would go more for a, for a, for a breakaway. I think it's hard to control. Uh, Van der Poel doesn't really have the legs, so you will miss Alpecin controlling the, the race. I don't know what Jumbo will do after the stage of today. <laughs> I guess they are a bit tired, so maybe they will take it a little bit easy. I think it's just the, like it's it's a day after, you know, it's the the race, the stage, uh, the day after the the war that uh, happened um, in the north of France and on the couples. And I guess I see more a breakaway. Uh, I give the breakaway a chance to be honest for this stage. Yeah, I can definitely also see the break taking it, but I wouldn't be surprised if. There is a peloton sprint for the win and then of course Van Aert is the clear favorite in my opinion. But we will just see because as you said they took a toll on a lot of riders and I can see many teams therefore not wanting to control the break. Isam, thank you for being here to discuss the first five days of the Tour de France. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. We will of course be following the rest of the Tour de France closely and will return with a new podcast once the results make that necessary. Thanks everyone for listening and goodbye.